earliest mentors, uh, Dr. Glenn Basie from Puget Sound Christian College. Um, that was one of his favorite songs. That we uh, we would use every time I every time I hear that song, I always think of his great influence in our lives. Now we're going to make a radical change in subjects. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, what does your donkey say? Well, we're going to be talking as we re go through our reading the Bible in a year program. This will be, uh, if you're using those little blue cards you can find out on the, in the foyer, you'll be noticing uh, this week uh, you will be coming across uh, the story of Balaam and his donkey. I was thinking yesterday about... Um, that well, if I really had any interactions with donkeys, and, and actually I remember that I do, and oh, this was when we lived in Myrtle Point, Southern Oregon, um, somebody thought it'd be a great idea to have a live nativity scene. And actually that's pretty cool. Um, uh, so we had a live nativity scene. Joni's brother, who, you know, kind of grew up in bigger towns, he was down to visit for some reason, kind of around that area. And so we had a Christmas parade in Myrtle Point. The Christmas parade consisted of uh, a couple of old cars that were decorated and the donkey from the Life Nativity Parade. And he still gives me a hard time about that, you know, the, uh, the donkey being the master of ceremonies, possibly. The thing with that donkey that I remember, because somehow or another I, I got the short end of the stick and I ended up having to kind of be in there with the animal managers. And so I had a sheep that slept most of the time. And I had a donkey who had some severe personality disorders. Um, not the least of which, he just kind of liked to take over. And I understood the idea of stubborn as a mule because if I wanted him to go over there, of course he goes over here. If I want him to stand still, he moves. If I want him to move, he stands still. Kind of reminded me of a toddler. You know, he just... He's just crazy. And uh, I could have a love-hate relationship with that donkey. But anyway, kind of a trip down memory lane, I guess. So we have, uh, let's make sure this thing is on. And it is, I like this donkey. I just, you know, you, uh, I, he just looks like he has some personality or an owner with a demented sense of humor. Anyway, um, I like this donkey. I'm not really sure what these poor people are trying to do. Um, it might be like a donkey basketball, that's what struck me. Although I always thought you stayed on the donkey when you were playing donkey basketball, and maybe this is a donkey tug of war or a relay race, the poor guy in the front. I don't think he's doing too well. What do you think? <laughs> I'm going to go eat here sometime. Uh, the stubborn mule uh, in Joseph, Oregon. It's a saloon, it's a spa uh, sta or space house. Okay, that could be a Freudian slip. Um, stubborn mule. Just looks interesting, doesn't it? And of course, one of our favorite donkeys. Uh, this is uh, Eeyore and uh, uh, Vicki Reese's daughter, Katie. This was always her favorite animal. and. Uh, just, just cute. Now, in our par in our story today, with uh, Balaam and his donkey, this is an image that I want you to put in your mind. They have a donkey in the foreground. A little hard to see, but uh, he's uh, he's struggling with Balaam, and Balaam's struggling with the donkey because the donkey is trying to get Balaam to see what's pretty much right in front of him, like that linebacker angel that you see back there, the one that's taking up pretty much the whole slide. Okay, that's what he's trying to get him to see. Of course, Balaam isn't seeing, or seeing it, and the dog will get to that in a little bit as we get into the text. But this would be your question today. What would a donkey say to you? If, you know, if I knew that was going to happen. Um, the sermon title, you know, that I came up with earlier was, you know, what does your donkey say? All right. Um, we had to change that because we only have two Y's in our lettering that we put out on the reader board. 
So there are times that I've had to change sermon titles a bit because Joe will come in and say, and I don't have letters for that. Oh, okay. So then we come up with, what would your donkey preach? It didn't occur to me after we got that out on the board that if people were paying attention, they would say, oh, yeah, I know that. What would your donkey preach? Okay, Bob, start preaching. We'll find out what the donkey's <laughs> preaching about. Just going to stop you right there. <laughs> and just going to settle you down right there. If you want to find out what your donkey will preach, you're going to hear it in just a moment. But we get past our old donkeys here. And we're in, we're in the 22nd <laughs> chapter of the book of Numbers in the Pentateuch, five books that start the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Penta means five, as you know, pentagon, pentagram, those kinds of things. So the Pentateuch, in Jewish writing, very holy, very sacred. Uh, some of those rabbis have those first five books of the Old Testament memorized. In Hebrew, Man, when I was in seminary, we had, I took Hebrew, I probably should more accurately say Hebrew took me on a, kind of a nice merry journey for 10 weeks. And uh, we had to memorize Genesis 1-1 in Hebrew. Barak uh, HaBalashim, that's about as far as I can get. Uh, Elohim in their back part of verse 1. At any rate, Numbers, uh, interesting book. We find more stories in there than you might imagine. So, Numbers 22, 22, uh, but God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stopped in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey and his two servants that were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to try to get it back on the road. When the angel of the Lord stood in the narrow path of the vineyards with the walls on both sides, and the donkey saw the angel of the Lord and pressed it close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot again. It, excuse me, against it, so he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place. There was no room to turn either to the left or the right. Then the donkey saw the angel of the Lord lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You've been a fool out of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? Nope, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with the sword drawn, so bow low, and fell face down. Three times. Face time, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, these three times have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. That's what the angel was saying. The donkey saw me, turned away from me these three times. Remember the significant number we talked about in Revelation with the number three? Remember, it's a perfect number. Uh, even though it's an odd number in our numerical system, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, those kinds of things. All right. If it had not turned away, I certainly would have killed you by now but I would have spared it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize that you were standing on the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel said uh, to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the Lex officials, and that's the end of what we're doing. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for these wonderful stories that have a bit of entertainment value, and, uh, but more importantly, they have a lot of spiritual value and teach us very readily what it means to, to hear your word. But as the book of James says, James says it, to be not only uh, hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. And 
We pray that we might learn today from the example of Balaam as set forth in your, your holy scriptures. Speak to us today through that same spirit, through your humble servant, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The situation that was going on here is that Balaam was, okay, uh, the people of Israel were coming up and uh, Balaam had brought the nation of Israel up into this area and you see Israel, uh, Ammon, a little bit south of that, Judah, a bit to the west. Notice the uh, Jordan River, Dead Sea, and that colored area is Moab that uh, you will see right there. And uh, the Ammon River and uh, Edom, Philistia, Philistia, and uh, Phoenicia up in there, very Old Testament map. Now, the important thing about Moab is notice the size. Notice the nation of Israel right now probably numbered around 2 million people. That had been brought, you know, uh, you know, into the promised land, gone through Exodus and Red Sea, the whole that whole thing. And when the people arrived here in Moab, that reputation had preceded them. That these were the people whose God, Yahweh or Jehovah, depending on how you put the vowels in it, Yahweh had taken care of them, had brought them out of slavery in Egypt. There were miraculous things that happened. This was a great, mighty people. And uh, to put it biblically, let's not mess with them, shall we? Okay, bigger army, bigger group of people. Let's just kind of leave well enough alone. Well, that's fine, except for the king of Moab was a bit on the nervous side. And what he wanted to do is he was tired of war, and he... This was not interested in conquering them. So what he wanted to do is he sent, and this is all in the front part of Numbers 22, uh, what he decided to do then is he, he paid money for witches and for uh, warlocks and divinators and all these different uh, voodoo-type people to put a spell on Israel. Put a spell on the people, wipe them out, get rid of them, make them sick, make them die, whatever the spell is. He didn't care. He just wanted to get rid of them. Because they were so big in size, they made him nervous. You'll remember back in Exodus, that was the same problem Pharaoh had. The Israelites had multiplied and got so big that Pharaoh was getting nervous. And a little hard to control, a few hundred thousand people. Wouldn't you agree? Ask our federal government, right? A little bit hard to do that. We could even get the group vaccinated, hardly, much less doing anything else. So you understand what it is to control a really good, big group of people. So as we come into this passage, the king of Moab, a guy named Balak, Balak uh, was just nervous, and he's wanting to curse these people, and that's not working out. He can't seem to find any sources that would do that. So he's, he tries to get Balaam, who is uh, a good Israelite, and he's following along with everything, and he's trying to get Balaam to put a curse on his own people. And God keeps taking Balak's instructions back to God, and God keeps saying, no, not going to do that. You're not going to put a curse on them. You're not going to hurt the people. Why? Because these are my people. These are people that I have protected and that I love and that I have brought out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the promised land. And this keeps going over and over and over. And you can read the first verses of Numbers 2 and you get all of that. And three times, oh, there's that number again, that Balak came, Balak came to Balaam and said, put a curse, go. Nope. Well, then come with me. Oh. And finally, Balaam was starting to get wore down a little bit. And he kept coming to God. And he kept pleading his case. And we find, we find here in, in the Numbers passage, 
uh, in around 21. And we find that Bill got up in the morning, sat with his aunt, he went with the Mobile officials, I'm, I'm back here a little bit. God was angry when he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balak had told Balaam, no, I'm not going to put a curse on him. But Balak said, well, come and we'll talk on my turf. And God said, no, you're not going to go there. Balaam wanted to go. God said, no. Does this sound familiar? Not familiar with your kids? <laughs> grandkids. Ken and I were out yesterday with visiting Angie and a uh, nice day so Johnny got to hang with uh, our youngest and uh, play with the baby and feed the baby and try to calm the baby down. I'm outside with the two kids and Angie, older kids, and the grand dogs. Love my two grand dogs, two beetles. Uh, one is really obedient and great and the other one's kind of more like a teenager, um, strong-willed with a good dose of ADD you know, drawn into it, you know. So we're trying to get this mutt to come running our, you know, to us, doesn't work. Briber with treats, nope. You know, briber with petting her, nope. Old patches just won't pull it together. Well, this is kind of where God was in Palem, and he keeps begging him. Finally, he said, you know, he's mad at him, but he lets him go. And as you read through that passage, you'll find that little contradiction. Here's how that works out. It's not a contradiction. The Hebrew there renders it more as a, okay, if you're going to go, go. Make sense? You know, like having an argument with a teenager. All right, if you're going to go, go. Just get going. You remember in the New Testament ever reading phrases were said that God gave them over to something? Romans 1, into sinful desires. It doesn't mean that God is saying, hey, yeah, go sin. All right, this is good. No, he doesn't say that. But really, it, God is a gentleman. And the reason why that fruit from the tree of, of good meat knowledge of good and evil was placed in the garden is so that man could have a choice. Now, would you rather have your loved ones, your kids, your grandkids, and everybody loving you because they're getting paid? Because their lives will be easier? Because somebody is bribing them or blackmailing them or cajoling them? No. You want people, we want people to love us because they honestly want to love us. Because they honestly care about us. Amen? Right? That's what God does. But if you're going to sin, go for it. And you'll figure it out later. And always, in those cases, every single time, God offers redemption. He offers a way out. When we're tempted, common to man, back to James again, my favorite book, and I think it's yours too, Barbara, right? And when we're tempted, we, we have, well, Paul talks about this, we're provided a way to stand up under it. Doesn't mean he's going to take it away. What it means is that we get the power to be able to deal with it, and that's exactly what's going on in this passage right here. Balaam wants to do his own thing. He's kind of getting weird. He's getting weary of Balak. He's like, oh, heck with it. I'll just go here with this idiot has to say. God's trying to tell him no in uncertain terms. But Now, this is going to come as a shock to many of you, but here's a biblical teaching. It's pretty straight. Here it is. Some of the people that we find in the Bible, when they're told with God told them what they're supposed to do, they were kind of stubborn. And they often didn't want to do it. Now, thank goodness in our century now we've really gotten past that. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, that was just kind of a problem in Bible times. No? Really? We ever get stubborn? Why did Jesus always say, you have ears, let them hear. It means pay attention, you idiot. You got two ears. Actually, do what you're told. That's kind of how it gets rendered, literally. And so we find Balaam walking with the donkey, or in some cases riding. Did you notice how narrow that spot was? 
He's got a wall on one side, he's got a vineyard on the other side. He can kind of sneak out into the rows, but you really don't want to. He's got the donkey, not a lot of room to go side by side, so he's more or less trying to ride the stupid thing. And it's going along. And then we read in the text that the donkey's eyes are open and he can see the angel. And the angel's got a sword. And the angel looks like he's getting ready to strike somebody. And probably both of them. So what's the donkey do? Donkey says, says, I'm not going anywhere. And Balaam does what? He beat the donkey. How many times? Three times. Now, when I was taught preaching, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Tom was the same way, I remember in a preaching class, we had to, as we were putting the sermons together, pay attention to about 10 different things. One of them was what they called the point of contact. In other words, you're reading along in the passage and something just kind of seems weird or strange. Something you might want to study a little deeper. Or maybe it's just a cultural thing, or it's maybe how this is different than that. It's just something your people are going to react to. Or maybe in my case, the preacher reacts to it. Okay? Make sense? Point of contact. How is this going to contact with the congregation? This is another one of those miracles that I think we read over in Sunday school lessons and we don't pay a lot of attention to it. Okay? The fact that the donkey is talking. God opened the donkey's mouth, and the donkey said, so, why are you beating me all these times? I've been your faithful donkey. And so what does Balaam do? His donkey is talking. What does Balaam do? He has a conversation with it. He has an argument with it. Now, I don't know about you, but if the next door neighbor dog came up and started up a conversation with me, I don't think I would say, hey, Fido, man, what's going on? I haven't talked to you in a while, buddy. How's the bone situation in town? Things are going good? Hey, we're having kind of a cat problem. Could you get, could you get on that for me, buddy? No, I'd be on the phone to Guinness World Records. And I've got a talking dog here. This is pretty amazing. No, Balaam's just sitting there having a conversation with his donkey like it's the most normal thing in the world for him to do that. Why do you think that's true? Well, it possibly that Balaam finally opened up a bit and thought, hmm, maybe it's God talking. Well, no shooting, Sherlock. Yeah, it's God talking. And so he gets this argument with the donkey. But Balaam still isn't getting the big picture. You notice that? He still isn't quite getting that. He's going, and he shouldn't be going. He should not be going to Balak. He should not be following him. He should not be heading in that direction. God kept him away from him for a specific reason. So then he opens Balaam's eyes. Note the donkey's eyes get open. Notice the donkey's mouth gets open. Notice that now Balaam's eyes get open. Wouldn't hurt to open his brain, but anyway. Um, so now he's able to see the angel. Remember the angel on the slide? The angel was this linebacker angel. I love that picture of the angel. Think about 50 feet tall. It's <laughs> Tannikin getting like, hi. And he's got a sword. Like, okay, here's the thing. You took about one more step, I was going to slice both of you to nothing. Why? Because what you're about to do is a sin. And what you're about to do is to sin against the living God. And we can't have that. He doesn't get into a big long explanation with him. Because for one thing, he isn't going to be needing the explanation. But the big thing is that, is that God just simply wants Balaam to obey. Now, because he wasn't trying to change Balaam's location. But he's trying to change his attitude. Balaam is like a piece I wrote one time for the Christian Standard. And it was entitled Brussels Sprout Theology. And it goes something like this. And this, I, we all do this. 
this. If you've ever fed a child, you've done this. Or maybe feeding a weird relative, I don't know, you know, it can go this way too. We were trying to feed something to our children. In my case, it was probably peas. I've told you about my relationship with canned peas. I think they're wonderful. They're in the garbage. They're at your house. They stay in the can at a warehouse in Mongolia. That would be great. But when I was a kid, they, they put it on. Their mom was like, okay, I put it on your plate, you're going to eat it. Okay. Well, some parents don't do this. My parents did, and I don't judge them. So we would negotiate. In other words, what is the fewest number of peas or the fewest number of Brussels sprouts that I have to eat in order to be in the mom's good graces? You ever had that with your kids? Some of you have, some of you haven't. You guys will figure it out, okay? Yeah. She's sweet now, and she'll be sweet the rest of her life, but there won't come that time. My son and I had a Mexican standoff over um, four peas on the plate. I was determined he was going to eat them, and he was determined he wasn't. Two hours we sat there and looked at each other. Oh, he's a strong-willed kid, he is indeed, which comes in handy at some point. My point is this. We approach sin the same way. What is the, what is the bare minimum that I have to do to be in God's good graces? Or what can I get away with and still not get zapped? Or what is the bare minimum of something good that I can do and still be in a good place with God? Does anybody see the problem with that? The problem with it is that that's not the attitude. If I am saying that I am a Christian, that Jesus Christ has forgiven my sins, cleansed me from all unrighteousness, became the righteousness of God on my behalf, so that I could be the righteousness of God. He took my sin so that I could be God's righteousness. So now I'm just going to see how many sins I can get away with. No. I'm going to, if I'm a Christian, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to do what he has to say. I'm going to do it gladly and willingly. Wow. And God says, no, I ain't doing it. God says, wait, okay. You ever notice he says wait to us quite a bit? Plus, he never gives me a timeline. Wish he would, but he doesn't. That's okay. Guess what? Have to have faith. I'll try that sometime. <laughs> Just actually putting ourselves in God's hands and letting him take care of it. Because, as one preacher put it, the donkey was God's better business bureau. Bureau. I like that. Do you remember when Jesus, when he was 12 years old, he went to the temple with his parents? Remember how the parents get about two days journey away and nobody had seen Jesus? So they have to hike back a couple of days, get back into Jerusalem, get into the temple courts, and there they find Jesus teaching the leaders. And remember when they begin to chastise him just a little bit, a little hard to get on your kid who's going to church, but they're, they're still getting after him a little bit. Do you remember what he said? I had to be upon about my what? You remember the phrasing? My father's business. Ah. A donkey was being about God's business. If a donkey can figure it out, you think we might be able to have a shot at it? I certainly hope so. We have to be about the master's business. And you see, there's, there's many ways that God speaks to us. He speaks, obviously, through the, uh, through the Bible. He speaks through other people, I've noticed. Uh, I've had, you know, I have people talk to me, and all of a sudden it occurs to me that God is speaking through them. Good advice, maybe it's just a different perspective, how to handle a problem. Wow. Okay, that's the Lord talking. And the person may not even realize that they're being used by God. 
Hard enough, the donkey knew it was happening anyway. But guess what? He was used. And we can have, in our, in our scripture, our intent is always with God. Uh, uh, true or false, the Bible says that we should pray once a day, 15 minutes right at the beginning of our day. True or false? False. The Bible says that we should pray at least an hour a day. False. True or false, we should be like Martin Luther and pray four hours every day. Probably got anything else sounds beyond me, but hey. True or false? False. Two words. First Thessalonians 5. And then look it up, I'll say 17. I'll maybe offer yes. the verse. Pray how often? Without ceasing. Continually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> depending on your translation, but yeah, continually, without ceasing, without stopping. How do I do that? Because my mind, my focus, my intention is upon God's business. And as we sang a week or two ago, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look, glow, and look full in his glorious face, and the things of earth will do what? They will grow strangely dim. So our minds, our hearts are always on God. If I look at a person, I'm seeing them as God's creation and God working through them. And I ask, okay, how can I be a blessing in their life? Or hey, maybe how are they being a blessing in my life? Maybe what is God trying to say through them? Or what is God trying to say through me for them? Make sense? Every conversation, every interaction. Whether it be the, the guy from the blind school who's uh, driving the car down the street, cuts out in front of you, does whatever. A little harder to pray for that person, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus said, yeah, you know, pray for the people who love you and that get along with you really well. Those are the people you should hang out with. True or false? <sighs> love, your, love your friends, good grief. Anybody can do that. Jack the Ripper <clears throat> could do that. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If somebody tells you to go a mile, go too. Somebody strikes you on the right cheek, off to the left. Why? Because I'm a pacifist, not necessarily, but because I'm humble. If I want to be great in God's kingdom, I need to be what? Servant of all. A servant of all. That's the kind of leadership we need in our country. That's what I think. If we had servant, Christ-like leadership in our country, wow. I don't care who you voted for. But if that person followed Christ really well, man, it would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. See, our intention is always on God. What would Jesus do, WWJD, remember that? What would Jesus think? How would Jesus react? How would Jesus respond? How would Jesus work through this situation? How would Jesus interact with that person that drives me completely nuts. And here's the answer. We know. We know. I'm going to close with a story that I think will do this. Corey Bertram was a Lutheran pastor serving a parish in mid-central Minnesota. In 2003, as the war in Iraq was developing, he learned that there is a dra drastic shortage of chaplains in the regular army and the Army National Guard. You know that is true? Here's how I know that, because uh, 2003 is when we uh, came here. Uh, very soon after that, uh, many of you remember Mark Kirk, one of our elders, he and I flew back to Virginia to Liberty University to take some instruction and training on church growth. And one day in between sessions, we were going through some of the, uh, the, the, you know, the boots and everything where they try to sell you things or recruit you. I wandered over the military <laughs> one, and there was a chaplain there. He's a retired priest. And he was trying to recruit me into the military because they had a desperate shortage of chaplains in that time. So this is true. Now he kept I'm sorry, sorry, sir. But he was 68 years old. And they brought him out of retirement, made an officer out of him, and sent him right into the lines. That's how much they needed chaplains. 
As long as I could walk in there and draw breath, that's what they wanted. Wow. So anyway, he enlisted in the Minnesota National Guard. November 21st, 2005, he receives orders to report to Fort Shelby, Mississippi to join the 1st Brigade Combat Team. And so to keep his friends and parishioners involved about his activities, he maintained a blog. His first posting went like this. In Numbers 22, there's the story of a man named Balaam who was riding his donkey to deliver a message for God, from God. On his way, the donkey three times leaves the path and will not go where Balaam wishes. Balaam beats the animal repeatedly until he's finally given the ability to see what the donkey has seen all along. An angel stands in his path, forcing the donkey to go another way. Each one of us, Hebrews tells us, it pursues the past that is set before us. But from time to time we are redirected. From time to time God moves us in directions we have not imagined. In my case, nobody wants to go to war. Nobody wants to feel the pain of separation from family and friends. Nobody. However, even in the path of pain, difficulty, trial. We are called to be faithful. <laughs> we at least ought to be as faithful as a donkey. What's the donkey trying to tell you today? Maybe to, maybe to follow what you already know to be true. Maybe to get rid of a habit or pick up a new one, call somebody, check in on somebody. Whatever it is, something that maybe you're not going to share with anybody else, but you know it. And the donkey is kind of going at it loud and clear because the donkey sees something that you haven't seen, that I haven't seen. Or something I know that's maybe there and I'm just kind of ignoring it. I'm kind of playing peekaboo with it. If I, if I don't see it, it'll go away. And so what we are called to do today is that if, if for us to be obedient, to have faith, to follow Christ no matter what, where that leads. We're going to share any kind of decision with us this morning as we sing our time of invitation and dedication this morning. We invite you to come, and even if you don't come, just to think about what is God saying to you today. It's going to be different than what he says to the person right next to you. That person may be your spouse, your best friend. But God is saying something to you today. If you want us to pray with you about that, we're certainly happy to do that. The elders are always happy to pray with you. But let's sing this wonderful song together. It's a great song. A little upbeat. But it's something that as parents we don't find ourselves saying a lot. Even to the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. To say yes to God and yes to somebody. And the thing is, God, when he calls us, doesn't call us to something that he will not follow us through. That makes sense? He calls you to go a certain way. He's going to give you the strength, the energy, the equipment, whatever it is to make that journey. If you're going through a temptation or a trial, he's providing a way that you can stand up under with him, which actually means in many cases that he's there just holding you up. I was replacing fluorescent bulbs yesterday. Bladders and I have a love-hate relationship. And so Joni is literally behind me, <laughs> holding me up there when I, and it still didn't work. But anyway, um, but it was good to know she was back there, that's for sure. What's God wanting to do for you and through you today? Let's stand together and sing this wonderful, wonderful song.